Uh, I actually met Robert uh, when I was 19 uh, at Newcastle University. Um, it uh, uh, was a bit of a tempestuous day. Robert uh, was a real wild man that day. In fact, I hated him when I met him. I thought he was just a horror, nightmare, hell on wheels. Uh, uh, it was just total chaos at the University of Poetry reading. He ended up in a, a kind of verbal brawl with the audience and being Newcastle in 1979, that was a pretty big brawl indeed. Uh, but anyway, that night, strangely enough, myself and uh, Two other friends, a musician and, and another one to be part of, like myself, ended up with Robert in a car and we went back to our friend's place and we played music and, and Robert was this whole other being, this uh, gentle soul, uh, very encouraging to all of us as young men. He was probably in his mid-30s, we thought he was an old guy. Uh, and that was the beginning of a kind of accidental, random, lifelong uh, friendship with uh, Robert and particularly in the last 10 years he was uh, very encouraging uh, about my work. Uh, he and Juno Jeans um, uh, were and are mentors to me uh, in many respects. Um, you've heard people refer to uh, a little tangentially maybe to the jail time that Robert did. There's an absolutely brilliant memoir by Robert called Inside Out, one of the great artist memoirs ever written in Australia, I think, anywhere. Uh, that is a, a really essential book to have in your collection if you can get a copy, helping you to understand Robert and the path of artists that, that come and rise from below. Uh, it also deals with Robert's boyhood and his love of birds, uh, so it's, it's beautiful as well as you know, traumatic at times when you see the institutional experiences that he, he went through in boys' homes and in jail. Uh, and of course, Robert's uh, collection, Reaching Light, which I think is available here, which is a selected poems, and is the ultimate expression, I think, of, of, the, of his career, uh, and is absolutely essential, which I highly recommend. And there's a kind of arc in that from the, the darkness of solitary uh, in Long Bay Jail, below ground, naked, in a damp, pretty well feudal type of cell from convict times, to the light by the river, to Robert's uh, love and creative relationship with Juno Jeans, and to a whole other period in his life. And uh, when Robert was dying and Juno posted that online, I was one of the people that uh, came to visit. And one of the things Robert said to me was that uh, something Juno had said to him about painting with light uh, because Juno's a photographer and how much that had meant to him creatively and I think spiritually as well in terms of his work and where he got to from uh, where he um, started in terms of his jail experiences. Um, so this poem that I wrote is called The Night Like the Day uh, and it's about the afternoon I spent with Robert knowing that he was dying, that I spent with Robert and Juno. Uh, and it's a kind of host of uh, memories of that day as I reflect on it at the Angler's Rest and things I knew about Robert's life and also that first experience at the end that I mentioned when I was a young man and, and met him. So yeah, uh, it's called The Night Like the Day. Twilight, fish and chips at the angler's rest. The Brooklyn night drifting off into itself with a hazy rain. Sparse streetlights burning, their halos moth scattered, drizzling white, pale white in a distant pale chain. It's still too warm to shiver despite the cool change. End of day, silver and soft, what photographers call the magic hour, luminous as an oyster shell and flesh. This town tastes like salt and silt and sky, an old drinker's dream of escape into another life. Post office, pub, the carved shack and its plastic crates. A boat moored at the jetty for leaving. Prawn shells on grey, smooth wood. You can smell 
humble me. Everything rhythmic, guarded, flowing. An imaginary tackle kit for catching colours, shadows, internal weather. It's been a long and beautiful day by the Hawkesbury River. Seas come in like the tide wash over me. You're home on the point at a crossroads of heavy water. It's blinding surface, it's stink of mud, revealed by the grip of the moon. A broken clawed bow bird with blue black feathers is stealing your keys, biting your finger. Why wow, things are so hard to take care of, you say. I'm complaining of your damaged friend. Rare books of poetry are opened and shared. Michael Palmer's idiot prayer staring up at me. A nurse at a round table visiting to discuss your spiritual needs, your final bed. Explaining the enteric coating on slow release painkillers. An old friend with a gospel name calls him to talk Bob Dylan and travelling with you forever in the companion order of the spirit. He recites a line from Wallace Stevens, the idea at Key West. She sang beyond the genius of the sea. Then he plays an old ballad on his iPhone that you used to know by heart about the ghosts of murdered lovers meeting at a closed window to kiss. Another friend arrives by boat, a local, non-literary, white glove in his white bucket, sitting on his steps conducting his repairs, an old master of shared silences and calloused fingertips. Eurydice looks at you through the doorway. This Greek myth is totally upside down and she knows it. You're obvious, all right, getting ready to cross the river. But she's the one that can't bring you back and is looking back anyway, loving you. Your boyhood dreams itself out of the Hawkesbury waters beside you. You can read it like the pages of a book. The way the river contains the changing sky, the big mulloway you should never have caught, your grandfather's wisdoms and tobacco tin, loaded with bone and pearls, third eyes from the skull of each mighty catch, a carbon for old men's bragging rights. The flood word, Rusty fish hooks, the shell mounds of the old people, a sign they left on a rock of a good fishing here, the lyrebird obsessed with blue that found you on a rocky shore and looked into your boy's eyes, the reaching light that changed your mind, the sound of the wind in the cool. listens to not dark yet in the early mornings while you sleep. Friends continue to visit. It's like you have flowed into all these lives and for a moment they are returning from the sea. Tide waters pushing back the inevitable end. Receiving visitors at your round table, you look as if a grey storm has beat you up. The ash of a bad dream in your hair, one of your eyes blackened from a fall, your tired eyes searching for the best way to go. Then you pep up and ignite, like a Brooklyn streetlight fizzing in the rain. The talk veers to Jared Manley Hopkins and the divine nature of life, Christ's face in a bird's wing, he smiled in the chrome rainbows of a fish poem about a bird hunting in the wind, how he got out of prison and met Brett Whiteley in Reading Rumbo while he painted an American apocalypse, a new cranked Highway 61 revisited, 
lightly cutting up your bird book for a masterpiece. It's true, only God can own anything. Later on, drinking whiskey with one-eyed Robert Creeley, his crow manner over your manuscript, hurling it across the room, demanding your truth. You're just bucking copying Robert Duncan. The way he breathed and paused when he spoke, no bullshit friends and a last glass of gin bang. Earlier, that kid Michael Dransfield at your morning door, with a fistful of poems and lyrical hopes, asking you to publish him now, now, now. He wrote five poems a night, he reckoned. He thought he was talking shit, but he really did. He was full of charm, he say so much charm. Too bad they reeled him in on a drug myth, the kind of death trip you fought to give away. You speak to me about loving cats and birds, the mystery of their friendship, despite the fact they are what you call natural enemies. You laugh at a fellow writer's observation that poetry is real losses and imaginary gains. Yeah, it is like that. The symbolic avery, the need for protection, the frustrations of flight in a cage when you've lost a claw, then a fine, cruel glimpse of reality's killing sky, and you're both headed out in ecstasy to meet the dawn, all absence and presence enfolded into a mist locals call for serpent's teeth. A breeze moves on up from the darkening river. I'm here across the way, reflecting on the day, one last silver hour at the angler's rest. I finish my meal, sip Coca-Cola, recall our first meeting years ago. Myself and two friends in our impure holy youth. Me full of rock journalism and bowl and lyrics friends and aspiring poet who works up with so lean and minimal they defied existence and musician who sang the best cover of Tangled Up in Blue I ever fucking heard. You're in my hometown making trouble for us drinking your American whiskey and spitting chaos at the poetry reading the literature remade as a public brawl. I hate the terror that you bring your savage wine but much calmer later you somehow end up riding with us to spin records at our home. Blood on the tracks and the pretender, discussing their images and the heartache, referencing Shelley and birds, the abyss and Neil Young, and Russ never sleeps, encouraging us to dream ourselves upwards. We don't have to stay prisoners. We can get out of jail free. There's a way through that's real. All of us living on words and music. It's hard, but you're going to sing yourself true. Yeah, the night like this day is beautiful. Thank you. Gorgeous, thank you, Mark. So now we're very lucky um, to have uh, Bob's partner Juno Gems with us. Gems is one of Australia's most celebrated contemporary photographers and has spent 40 years documenting the changing social landscape of Australia. Her portraiture and photo essays have been extensively published, and she's had numerous national and international solo exhibitions. And her work uh, works are held in the National Portrait Gallery. National Gallery of Australia and Art Gallery of New South Wales, among others. Between 1986 and 2010, James and her partner, Robert Adamson, were co-directors of Paperbark Press. Thank you, Gina. thinking about the idea of gratitude and the 
where it's, its place in a culture. And what a beautiful expression of gratitude this is. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you all. Can you help me? So as you've heard, Bob's life was absolutely dedicated to poetry. He believed in it as a religion almost. Um, So a dyslexic kid who uh, left school at 13 became the pal chair of poetry over a lifetime of absolute dedication and erudition. He brought American poets to Australia. He published, he, out of nothing, he created not only paperback press, it started with new poetry, prison books, then paperback press, Box Kite, which was an international journal of poetry, and so it goes on. But his real joy was to mentor other poets because he believed in the purpose of poetry to, ex to, to really take you to the heart of what language can do. And his great joy was in mentoring. And as you can hear from Judith onwards, I remember you, in Wagga Wagga Workshop. <laughs> Absolutely. And so I, I'm so grateful to you and thank you so much. But um, so my purpose here really is to introduce only six months ago, we launched Bob's last book to date. There will be more, but his last books to date was his collected poems published by Flood Editions called Reaching Light. And, Actually, we had to wait for two years to launch at COVID and all that made it impossible. And then finally, we were able to launch it at um, the Brick Whiteley Studio and uh, we filmed it. We had the idea to film it and it turned out to be his last reading. But before I introduce it to you, I want to thank Michelle Mich Samir Samara for br bringing everybody together to create this event, and with any more ado, here he is. Thank you. <laughs>